Uh, so tonight is, uh, we call it the core value prep. So last Wednesday of the month, we're going to be teaching the 10 core value classes consecutively through from the end of May all the way to the beginning of August. Now, we did this last year, and um, like I said, those are, there's, I actually think that's 11 classes. You know, we started with the DTR, and then we go through with uh, the whole sequence, you know, the word study, the way of the king, uh, church and kingdom, sin, resurrection, uh, kingdom fellowship, counting the cost. I might have missed one in there. Uh, and, then, and then we had kind of a follow-up. We're going we're gonna to teach these every single year. But tonight, uh, I just wanted us all to get on the same page, to all understand why is it that we are going to do this every year? Why is it that learning how to do this is necessary? And why even is it that having a core value study series is necessary, right? That's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, but you can open your Bibles to Isaiah 55. I was thinking about this the other day, uh, and there's a reason I wanted to, see, to sing Bound to the Rock. I think that that whole song obviously comes from John 8, 31, and it, it, it Literally, as we sang, the Jews who believed Jesus, Jesus tells them belief isn't enough. But you have to do something very specific. And what he says is, you have to hold to my teachings, right? Or uh, another translation says, you have to abide in my word. You have to live in my word, right? Uh, and then as, as we sing that, it, what it says is, if we do that, we'll be Jesus' disciples, Meaning, if you don't live according to Jesus' words, you can't be his disciple. But then when we live as disciples, what happens? It says, you will know the truth, and that truth will set you free. And I could preach a thousand sermons on what it means to be free, but what I'd like to encourage everybody to do as they come into contact with Cola Church or into contact as us as disciples, as, and as we uh, open the word with people, what I want people to learn is that it's not about somebody explaining something to you. It's about experiencing the truth of the Bible. We can get really good at explaining things. In fact, we're about to have a whole training series on how to explain things. But the key is the practice of it all. Is the actually doing the thing, the actual being bound to the Rock. And I can get emotional sometimes when I sing that song. And I, I, I sing it to my kids every night because I think that song sums up everything they need to know about the world. And that the only thing that they ever need to focus on in their lives, it'll, it'll, it'll affect everything, is that they just need to be bound to the rock that is Jesus Christ. But that's no easy thing to do, is it? And there's a lot of other things out there that claim to be rocks, that claim to be things that you can build your house on. But we are a people whose entire lives are focused on that concept, being bound to the rock that is Jesus. So we're about to talk about these Bible studies. And as we think about the Bible studies, as we think about the core value studies, I just want you guys to keep this scripture in mind. Um, God says... First of all, it starts off in Isaiah 55. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good. And you will delight in the richest Bear. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. This, this whole thing is about the word of God. It's about listening to God's word. And if you do, it says you will be satisfied. But who's he calling? He's calling those who are thirsty. Right? And I want to go down to the scripture that uh, I wrote this to my daughter the other day. In a, in a letter, it says in verse 6, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord 
and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. God's word is going to bear fruit. God says, my word is going to go out and it's going to make a difference. So even though we're about to talk about these Bible studies and, and talk about the practicals, um, all of the classes are going to be more like this. They're going to be more conversation style. You're like, you ha no, I haven't had a conversation. You haven't asked me one question, Perry. They're going to be more conversation style. Uh, we're going to be talking through practicals and stuff like that. But I wanted to start with this one point, is that the power is in the word of God. You could not know all the points you need to make. You could be dusty, rusty, crusty. My wife added crusty. Please don't be crusty. <laughs> but if, if we just open the word with people, it will make a difference. So the goal here is not that we become experts, though we should strive to be experts. The goal is not that we become the greatest Bible scholars, though we should love the Word of God. The goal is that we are people who open the Bible all the time, every opportunity we can get. Why? Because it literally is that powerful. It literally does satisfy. As the scripture says, it's the richest affair. It's the best food you can eat, and it's the best food you can give somebody. And I want to start there because if that's not your conviction, you've got to fight to have that conviction about the world. Like, I watch all this fantasy stuff, and I watch all this fake stuff, and it's, you know, powers and superheroes and all this kind of stuff. This is the real superpower. And we shouldn't want to open it with people because it's what our church does. Because our ministers told us to. Because we feel like we're not real Christians if we don't do it. No, it should be none of that. It should simply be, we believe this thing is immensely powerful. And we believe that there are people out there who are thirsty. And who, who are trying to seek the Lord while he may be found. And, and we, we have been drinking from this well, many of us, for decades. Uh, in my, on my prayer walk, I sing... Um, God Almighty reigns a lot. And there's that line in that song, Oh, the waters that he washed me with, I share with thirsty souls. Until all around the earth, his word is sung. It's this idea that what we've experienced in the word of God is just so good. It's just so satisfying. We just simply want someone else to experience it. Even if we don't think they need it necessarily, because we got a lot of people out there, they look like they got everything. But we should recognize that people should want this thing. And yes, it's going to call us higher. Yes, it's going to call us into changing our lives and transformation. We understand that that can get, you know, prickly for people. But at the end of the day, what it's giving us is truth and freedom. So I just, I wanted to say that. Uh, so the rest of this night, I'm just going to ask a few questions just so that we can all get on the same page about what exactly these core value studies are. So my first question. Now, Daniel Vance is over here. He's one of our teens in the team ministry. He is what we call a runner. So when you are ready to answer the question, you raise your hand. He will run to you. If he doesn't run, he gets fire, right? He's a runner. He's not a walker. He's not a mosier. So when it's your turn to speak, uh, he will bring you the microphone, all right? So, my first question, and these are going to be, you might think they're dumb questions, but I just, I, we wanted to have this night just so that we're all on the same page. Okay, what are the core value studies? That's the first question. What are the core value studies? 
And there, there is a right answer, but you can answer however you want. Yeah, Devin has his hand up. Okay. Give him a round of applause, please. He said the core, the core value studies are our onboarding process. If somebody wants to be a member of Cola Church, we go through these core value studies with them so that they understand exactly what it means to be a member here at Cola Church. Now, another way to put that, right, everybody, you know, I just said we're bound to the rock. we got to use scriptures. Uh, Matthew 28, can, any, can somebody stand up and quote uh, Matthew 28, 18 through 20 for me? Does anybody know it off the top of their heads? Dom, you don't count, you're on staff. Anybody? I need a brave soul, stand up, quote Matthew 28. Yeah, go ahead, hold on, let the runner come to you. <laughs> then Jesus came to them all and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptize them to the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Give a round of applause. Come on. <laughs> Yeah, everybody was saying along with her. Yeah, look, Jesus' last words on earth, Matthew 28, the Great Commission, go and make disciples, right, of all nations, teaching them to obey, uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He says, teaching them to obey everything. So, onboarding process, I think that's a very good way to put it. Another way to put it is our Matthew 28 process, okay? Now, I mentioned before uh, that, well, I'll just stop there. The core value studies are our onboarding process or our Matthew 28 process. They are a process on how to help somebody be a disciple. But more than that, like that doesn't, it's not like in a moment you're just a disciple and then, you know, you don't need to learn anything else. No, it's our whole process on how to teach somebody the full concept and idea and practice of living like Jesus. That's why our core value studies include not just those first 10 core value studies, but the several follow-up studies that we have after. In fact, I would argue most of the work in making a disciple happens after baptism. Okay, again, you should look at it like a child being born. If you hear some squeals and some squeaks, we just had a child be born the other day. Now, while the baby incubated in Nikki's belly, right, for however long that was, nine months, she didn't like that term, uh, there, there, was, there was work for her, right? That was, she was tired, she was exhausted, it was, it was draining her nutrients. Um, but now that the baby is out, it's even more work. She's even more tired, and it's going to take like 18 years to help this small creature become an adult, right? Now... Uh, what's awesome is that spiritual growth happens a lot faster than physical growth, right? It, it, <laughs> Nikki says it can. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> um, but, but that's the whole idea. So it's not just about getting them to the waters of baptism or getting them to become members. It's ultimately about uh, maturity. Okay, so it's our onboarding process or it's our Matthew 28 process. If somebody asks you, why do you have core value studies that you make people do because they become members? First of all, a person that asks you that is not familiar with churches in general. All churches have this. All churches have an onboarding process, right? Because you, you're not, you don't just walk in and, you know, say you're a member somewhere. Uh, all churches have an a, a onboarding process, but not all churches have a process to make disciples. And there is a difference between be, being a member of a church and being a disciple. The difference here is that we want all of our, the members of Cola Church to be disciples, right? So that's why the core value studies have a dual purpose. Teach somebody how to be a member of our church and teach somebody how to be a disciple. Now, I just said a little bit of this, but I'd like to see some other answers that you guys have. Why do we do the core value studies with people? It can be slightly different. Uh, Miss Cheryl is raising her hand. that we will all 
be on that same page. And that's so important because it should be that someone asks one question and get a lot of different answers from people in the same congregation. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that we're all on the same page. Absolutely. I, I mentioned last year, but the, the whole goal should be that we go out into the world, you know, and any member of Cola Church, and some Joe Schmo asks, you know, you know, you know, what's your church all about? We're going to all be on the same page about what we're about and what we're trying to do. And the core values give us that common language. Yes. So people know what they're getting into when they say they've become a disciple. Yes, absolutely. So people understand what they're getting into when they become Christians, okay? And this is very important because there are a lot of churches out there that will preach salvation really, 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 really hard. That you need to believe in Jesus, right? Uh, believe on him, and you will be saved, right? But then they don't explain what it means to be saved, right? Or what it means to actually believe in Jesus or follow Jesus or be a Christian or be a disciple. And therefore, there are a lot of people who go to churches and they have a salvation experience, but they never learn how to be a follower of Jesus, right? Now, that's obviously a hole in the American gospel in general that we have, but our goal is to clear that hole up. We don't want anybody to be confused about what it means to be a Christian. And we sure don't want to show up on Judgment Day and, like, stand before Jesus and not have known what we signed up for. That would be crazy, right? And if we do that, hopefully he has grace on us, but... Let's try to get it right on this side of eternity rather than on that side of eternity. Uh, Barry has his hand up. Go ahead, Dan. I think another big reason why we have the core value studies, though, is as much as God's been showing us some really new and interesting kinds of people that we're studying the Bible with, there's still a lot of people out there that need to hear the gospel for the first time. Absolutely. And that this is a tool that we can use to share the gospel. Yes, absolutely. There are people out there who, even though we're in the Bible Belt, they didn't grow up Christians. And they simply just need to hear the truth of the gospel and the truth of the power of God and his kingdom. Miss Dale had her hand up right back here, all the way in the back. I think, too, just to add to what everybody else has said, it's, it's the process of really training the heart. To become a disciple. Absolutely. Because we can be about the business. Yep. But the heart, the heart can be very challenging. Absolutely. To be transformed. So the core value helps to transform the heart of those who would like to be a disciple. Yes. Uh, Damien John Peptis put it a good way to me years ago. He said, it's not about transferring information. It's about transforming hearts. Not the information, the transformation of the heart. Uh, I wrote down two things. Oh, sorry. Uh, Miss Callistine, right back here. I think, too, like, I don't know if someone said this before, but John 8, 31, 32, people want to know the truth. Yes. You know, the world, so many different churches, says so many different things. It's like, what is the truth? Right. What does the Bible say? Right. And then, too, like Jesus, like um, John 8, 31, 32 says, they have no truth, and the truth will set them free. We right. need to be set free. Absolutely. From this world, from yep. what's going on. Yeah, and from our sins. I wrote down two words here to try to summarize it, but I think I'm going to add a third. But the two words I wrote down were, uh, I said, why do we do the core value studies? I said, membership and maturity. Membership and maturity. Now, I should add a first word there, like, for people to become Christians in general, right? So, these are a perfect tool to help somebody who's not a Christian become a Christian. They're also the perfect tool to help somebody who might have had a saving experience at some point in their lives or might have been saved at some point in their lives. It's a great tool to help them grow mature as well. And that's a... I would add also a tool to help people who have been religious and need to look at the Bible and see where they stand on that, you know, where they stand, saved or not. 
a mirror, you know, a process of looking in the mirror at themselves, challenging them to do that. Absolutely. And that's a big thing. One of the biggest changes that we made last year that we, we've tried to emphasize, and I think it confused some people, is that for a long time, we had the, I, we had the stance of, if you haven't done these core value studies and ain't been saved in our tradition of churches, you ain't, you ain't legit, you ain't saved, you got to do it here, you got to be baptized here. We're moving away from that. There's people getting saved all over the place, right? But it doesn't mean they're getting discipled, and it doesn't mean they're getting trained how to be followers of Jesus, all right? So the whole idea, idea here is whether you've been saved before or not, when you come to us, we're going to teach you just from ground zero what it means to, Christ, to, to be a Christian. And that means if we get to that baptism study and we talk through what it means to be biblically saved and you are honest with yourself and you look at the scriptures and you look at what you experience and you feel like you've obeyed the scriptures, amen. We won't baptize you again, but we're still going to finish these Bible studies before you place membership. Because you might have gotten saved but not agree on practicing discipleship like we practice discipleship here. And so, again, it, it's, it's not just about membership, but it's about maturity as well. So that means that could be somebody who, like Nikki said, uh, spiritual growth sometimes can take as long as physical growth. But there could be somebody who's been saved back, you know, 18 years ago, but never got taught how to actually follow Jesus. So when they find us, it's not that they were obstinate or that they didn't want to follow Jesus. They were doing it to the best of their ability. But... As they come here, we're going to say, okay, this is, this is how we practice it here at Cola Church, right? As for us and our household, this is how we serve the Lord. So if you want to be a member here, you've, you've got to go through these studies and, like, agree with this is how you're going to practice Christianity here. And, and, and also, that, that relieves us from the idea that if somebody finishes the studies and they're like, I don't want to be here. We're like, hey, amen. Go find a congregation. That fits for you, okay? Uh, but again, for us in our household, we're going to follow Jesus in the way that these core, core value studies uh, lay it out. Um, any other hands? Okay, next question I want to ask you guys. And I kind of already answered this, but uh, I'd like to just hear you guys kind of reiterate what, uh, what was just said as well. But who are the core value studies for? Who are the core value studies for? Nick is up here raising his hand, but did you see somebody else, Daniel? Tracy? <laughs> um, the core value studies are for anyone that wants to be a member, also anyone that is wanting to become a disciple or a Christian. Great answer. Absolutely. Anybody who wants to become a member, anybody who's looking to become a Christian, um, there's a third one I was going to say, but I'll see if anybody else catches it. Go ahead, Nick. Oh, did she just take your answer? Anyone and everybody. So I, I think this is something we need to understand. The core value studies, even though it's something that we do with other people, they help us as well. Right? Like the fundamentals are very, very important. So they are as beneficial to the people who are in those studies as they are to the people who are, uh, who the study is being done with. All right, so that, that's great. Anybody and everybody, right? It's, it's for us. They are for us too, right? If you're feeling shaky in your faith, you know what you can do in your quiet times? Go do the core value studies again, right? Now they get you sturdy. Go do the, go do the follow-up studies again. Now they get you sturdy. I am so encouraged, you know, in our firm foundation classes, there were several members of, of Cola Church who have been here for a long time who just wanted to come because they're like, hey, I'm going to get my foundation firm again, you know? It's, it's good to be reminded of the things that we are Binding ourselves to, right? Reminded about the rock that we are bound to. And the thing I was going to add to Tracy's answer was uh, somebody who wants to be a member, somebody who wants to become a Christian, and maybe somebody who is already a Christian but wants to grow more mature as well, right? Uh, this is going to help with uh, all of that, right? Membership and maturity. Uh, are there any other answers when it comes to this question? <laughs> Go ahead, AJ. I can, <laughs> uh, well, I was just going to add on to the current answers that we already have, but just past kind of like the physical people of actually having the study, I was just going to say for the hearts and spirits willing to 
kind of make that change, really, try, really trying to chase their faith down and using those core studies as their firm foundation to dig deep into their own lives. Absolutely, right? Anybody who is thirsty, right? And who exactly. is seeking the Lord uh, when he may be found. Um, I added this question in because there were a lot of questions the first time around about this whole concept. Like, the question was, what if somebody was baptized in our fellowship of churches, but moves to Cola Church? Do they then have to do the core value studies? Does that question make sense? Like, if it's all about being a member here, does somebody who moves from a sister church, when they come here, do they need to do the core value studies? And the answer is no, because our core value studies are relatively universal across our entire fellowship of churches. If you were converted in any ICOC church, you have done some variation of the core value studies. Now, depending on when you got baptized or where you're at in your faith, there are a few things that you might want to do with a person who's been baptized elsewhere and they move here. Uh, the first thing that we do want every move in to do is the firm foundation classes. Now, those have been kind of unorthodox for the last several months just because of our schedule changes and whatnot. But if somebody new moves to the Cola church from a sister church and they're in your small group and you are a small group leader or you are a small group shepherd, my advice is that you guys make sure that they go and at least listen through those 12 firm foundation classes just so that they understand again what Cola Church is about. Because even though our core value studies, our Bible study series are relatively the same across the board, there are different nuances when it comes to specific churches. And we're not talking about, you know, any large doctrinal things, but we are talking about just the way we do things, the way we practice, right? Y'all ever gone to a sister church, you know, and you're singing a song, and you're singing it mad confidently, but like, their song is like just a little bit slower or just a little bit faster, and you're like, oh no, I done messed the whole thing up, and then you lost the whole rest of the time. Maybe you have an experience that I have, and, it's, and it's, it's usually glory, glory, hallelujah. Some of the other churches be doing it weird. Um, but, like, that, that, that goes for a lot of the... <laughs> Charleston, yeah, y'all 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 weird. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of uh, the, the nuances, there are small things that we just... We want people to, who move here to understand that we're expecting them to be all in, to, to actually be a part of the mission and the vision that we are chasing together. So I wanted to make sure I mentioned that tonight uh, as well. Uh, this is an important question, and this is the last question that I, I had wrote, written down, and I'm going to open it up to you guys. Um, but this last question uh, is, what is the most important part of the core value studies? And there are, there are a few answers to this. There's a specific answer I'm looking for, but I could have worded this better to fish it out of you guys. But I'll see what you guys, see what you guys say. Okay, uh, Devin and then Nick. We got the campus guys up here tonight representing. <laughs> they, they are so humble. So this time, I don't think I have the right answer. Okay. But this is the one that's always on my heart. My thing is always about making sure that there's like a change of heart or perspective. When okay. it comes to seeing the word of God. Okay. Making sure that somebody is actually transforming when they when they encounter the Bible. That's a great answer. That was a soft way of saying it wasn't the right answer. Just just to build off of uh, transforming your heart, I would say what is it? Making the word your standard. Okay. I would say that's probably the most important. Absolutely. Making the word your standard. That is a great answer. Um uh, we got <laughs> I okay, yeah, go ahead. Where's the runner at? This man not doing his job. <laughs> okay, uh, you. <laughs> go, no, you can go ahead. You can go ahead. Okay, okay. Um, I think for me it would be, or just from being in other people's studies, I think it would be like realizing that Jesus died for your sins, like okay. specifically, absolutely. Like realizing the big impact of right. that. Like the things that you share in the sin study with like in the middle of the core value studies, um, I feel like that's one of the main important things, like realizing that Jesus died for your sins. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> teaching the truth of the gospel and what happened on the cross. That's a great answer. Uh, go, go ahead. Um, I, I saw Angela's hand uh, back here. Uh, 
first. Sorry, um, Denise. Way, way back here, yeah. I would say it's counting the cost because once you know the truth, you still have to make a decision to live by mm, it. That's you great. still got to, to know that this is a commitment that you made for your life yes. and to God. So yeah. I think it's, it's the commitment. And, and to that, I will say, I know our last study is called Counting the Cost, but in actuality, the entire core value study series is us counting the cost, where we are laying out, hey, if you want to be a Christian or if you call yourself a Christian, this is what you are saying you do in how you live your life. So that's a, that's a great answer. Um, uh, let's see. All right, Daniel, um, we're going to go. So Cindy, Dex, Clinton, AJ, and then. Since I got the mic. Uh, Since I got oh, the mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can go first. Okay. I, I'll remember and I'll point them out. Okay. So we'll get to you. Yeah. I think the most important thing is lordship. Making Lordship. Jesus Lord over every area of your life. Absolutely. If According Lordship, to the scriptures. Yes. If, if going in those waters is you trying to get your sins forgiven and not trying to make Jesus Lord, you've, you've missed the whole point. Those waters are the representation of you submerging everything to the Lordship of Jesus. All right. Next is uh, Cindy back there. These are all great answers. We haven't hit on what I'm looking for yet, but. I think the most I think the most important thing is building and keeping your relationship with God and making it stronger as every day goes by. Absolutely. Building and keeping your relationship with God, helping somebody understand that intimacy with God is is everything. It's everything that we are doing. Great answer. Dex, you were next with the fedora. Dex with the fedora. Okay, so the first word that immediately came to my mind is understanding. Ultimately, it all comes down to understanding the word, understanding that God loves you and Jesus was sent to die for, for you. It, it all just comes down to understanding for me personally. Absolutely, yeah. And, and I will say that is a lot of what we are doing in the Core Value Studies. There is so much misunderstanding about the Bible and Jesus and Christianity and salvation, all of that. And especially in the Bible Belt, you would think in a place so saturated with the Word of God, there'd be a lot less confusion. But everybody is confused out here and they don't know what they are talking about. So a large aspect of these core value studies is to help people clearly understand the Bible, right? What happened in, in Acts chapter 8? The guy was sitting there. He had the word. He was reading the book of Isaiah, but he was humble. Philip said, hey, bro, do you know what you're reading? The guy said, I have absolutely no clue. Can you explain it to me? Our core value studies, are it, that's, it, that's our way of explaining the scriptures and helping them understand. Uh, next was uh, Mr. Clinton Barzi, right here in the red shirt. Daniel got a workout tonight, guys. He didn't know he was, he should have counted the cost before he decided to be a runner. Okay, I would say that since these core value studies are for people who are Christians already or people who want to become Christians, that the main part of this would be people who commit themselves to be kingdom people. Absolutely. People committing themselves wholeheartedly to being kingdom people. Again, good. Great answer. Then we had AJ. This is great. I didn't know this was going to be such a cliffhanger in my brain. <laughs> I'm, I'm liking what's coming out of this. No, I, I want to hear everybody. I want to hear everybody says first. I really, like, I really like the fact that commitment was brought up because I was going to say that these core value studies, from at least the studies that I've been in, they have been somewhat... Um, Kind of from, from people, of course, from different, different people from different backgrounds see them differently. So these core value studies, when you introduce them to somebody, it can go either way. But I think a very important aspect of them is the beginning anyways. 
because that introduction and going through a million no's and then finally getting to a yes shows that start of commitments. Absolutely. It definitely shows like a like ur somewhat urge to build that firm foundation with Christ. Sure. Absolutely. It's a, it's a great start to someone uh, who might want to build a commitment. All right. right Miss Janet Rice right here. Or did you or did you still have an answer? I just wanted to say that, you know what, there were no such thing as any core value studies in 1978. Come on. <laughs> Come on. And you know what? I was so eager. And I, when I walked in the door and people loved me so much until I wanted to be a part of what they had. And so I didn't really understand what Randy McKean himself sat down with me and studied. But... I didn't really realize, and this was because I was so young. I think that it's so good that they go so slow with people, younger people, because I didn't know it was my actual sin that put Jesus on the cross. I got yes. baptized not understanding that. I, I thought that was for those. See, when you go to a, another denomination, they preach to the people outside. Everybody in the church, they say, you know, we say, but what about? Those people out in the world mm -hmm. that you don't even know that they're, I mean, what's going on for you? Yep. And so you come in all confused thinking, you know, you're pretty good. Those people out there, they sin. Mm -hmm. And they put Jesus on the cross. And I didn't have too much of anything. I didn't understand. I, right. I had anything to do with Jesus going to the cross for my sins yes. until years later. I, I was already in this church. And I went back and they encouraged me to study the Bible myself. Mm. Go back and get convicted of your own sins and, and read it. Because right now you love God, you know some things. Just go ahead on and, you know, repent of whatever you can repent of and move on. Yeah. So I am, I am grateful for the new core value study Amen. that Amen. you all get the chance to get these days. Because they, you can always add on new studies that people need, make it more catered to them. Right. Right, absolutely. So Great. are you saying that it's about sin, like understanding sin? I'm saying it's about understanding it's your sin. Mm, come on. Amen. Idris. Okay. <laughs> All right. Tell me. That's awesome. Yeah, okay. We got a few more back here. Um, there's a lot. It was Stan was first. It was Stan. All right. Uh, let, let me just say this order, and then, and then I'll share the answer. All right. Stan, DJ... Jale, Sue, Taryn, and then, okay, and, you, and, and Matthew will be Remember last. that, Daniel? And then you'll be after Matthew. All right. It's your surrender to a higher power. It's your surrender to a higher power. Absolutely. That goes with the lordship as well. Uh, DJ, you were next. I'm so excited. Every time somebody answers, it just builds more power to the final answer I want to give. And mind you, none of these are wrong, okay? All... All of these things are equally important to the studies. So we're building the kingdom and we're developing the relationships for our partners in the gospel. Okay. I'm going to, we're going to, we're going to pause right there. All right. So, so we're going to pause right there because this is what I was waiting for. I want to, I want to, I want to read the scripture. I want, uh, more, um, prizes in heaven. So. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Guys, listen to this, okay? This is very important. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Go to Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 14. And I love this because he's talking about the purpose of a family and and we are not just a church we are not just the called out but God built the church to be a
family. What kind of family? For this reason I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his uh, spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And in Colossians, he talks about, uh, they, they uh, preached on this on Sunday, but love binds all these virtues together, right? And I, and I just want to say this. There are a lot of people leaving the church. And that's not, like, it's not cola church. Like, sometimes I can start feeling bad, boo-hoo, I'm like, wait, <laughs> that's happening everywhere, okay? People are leaving Christianity in droves. But, like, if we're, we've arrived at a humble place where we're like, okay, we're not the only church. We're not the only church, it's not a thing. Um, yes, we do believe we are preaching the truth, right? We do believe we are practicing what the Bible calls us to practice, and we do believe that if you come here, you are going to, to find the truth and find Jesus, but we don't have a monopoly on that. And without the monopoly, it means we can't force people to stay here. And it means that people, grown people, can make their own decisions about wherever they want to go to worship Jesus. So what keeps them here? If it's not our monopoly on the truth, what keeps them here? You know what keeps them here? Relationships. Love. So here's the deal. You could sit through an entire core value study and explain everything perfectly. But build no relationship so the person has no reason. Well, you know, you, there are reasons, okay? The Bible is true, and even if we all fail, like if somebody really gets the Bible, they'll understand that anywhere they go, you know, people are going to fail. Okay, but I'm just talking about us right now as we, as we teach the Bible studies. If we're not building relationships, guys, this stuff is not going to be as effective as it can be. And Paul literally says in Corinthians, like, we're doing nothing. We can, we can preach all the truth we want, but, but if it is not bound together with love and with relationships, then it's, it's not going to work. And I, I say this because you shouldn't be so focused on doing the Bible studies perfectly. We should be very focused on loving people well. It, it should be, you, you should have two ultimate goals in your Bible studies. That this person knows Jesus better and becomes a Christian and a kingdom person or grows more mature wherever they're at. And then this person becomes one of your best friends. Like those two goals are, are as important as the other. And, and we, the way we do the studies is we'll invite a lot of people into the studies, right? Like if somebody's studying the Bible and, and they're in your D group, well, you'll invite a few more people in your D group. And, and, and sometimes we're like, well, you know, let's say I'm leading the study, but there's four more guys in the study, but I'm the one leading. Well, the role of everybody else is to just become best friends with the person. Yeah, we sat down, we talked about the word, but when we leave here today, that's when the real study starts. The real study happens outside the Bible study. The real study happens when you have them in your house, over for dinner, when you guys go out, when you hang out, when you text, when you talk, when you, when you share reels and memes with each other. That's the other people who get that. Um, and Caesar. Caesar always sends me reels. It's kind of hilarious. Uh, it's... It's all about the relationship. And, and this means, guys, there will be many people who do not make it through the studies or become members of the church or stuff like that. They should still be your friends. Like, if we do it right, they might be like, well, I don't agree with X, Y, and Z, but I really love the bond. So I just wanted to share that. I know we had a few more people who wanted to answer, but I just, I, I, I really, and again, there was no wrong answer. 
But if we don't get this, that is wrong. Okay? If it, for, First Corinthians says we can do all, we can do all the, if I did all the Bible studies perfectly but have not love, we have gained nothing. So, and, and, and I want to challenge us all in this. I'm, I'm, that means it's going to require far more time of us. That if, if we actually commit to what it really means to make disciples, to build these relationships, guys, it means we're going to be busy people. We're going to be giving of ourselves a lot. But it's the kind of giving of ourselves that is refreshing and freeing in the end. So I wanted to emphasize that. Now, I have one last question I want to ask. It's 8.03, so we'll close out soon. But do you guys have any questions about the Bible? Follow these core values. Do you guys have any questions that we did not address or uh, solidify tonight? I just wanted to make sure we gave you guys. You know, do you have any concerns? Like, yeah, I don't really like you know that we try to teach people the Bible. You know, um, maybe you don't want to say that one out loud. <laughs> there are people who have shared that with me before. Um, any questions about the Bible studies? Okay, amen. Okay, Idris. This five circles of Christian fellowship. Ah, uh, yes. I didn't really understand. Okay. So in the old, in the old first principle studies, um, we had what was called a false doctrine study. Okay. And the purpose of the false doctrine study was basically to explain that everybody else was whack and not Christians and that we are the only Christians. Um, and and I, I say that kind of jokingly, but I mean, that was, that was the primary point of the false doctrine study. It was to explain all the false doctrines and all the other denominations out there. It was actually even to explain that, to explain that denominations in and of themselves are sinful, um, which I don't necessarily disagree with that, but the, once you start being a church, you become a denomination, whether you like it or not. Uh, Stone and Campbell, you know. Their whole mantra was, you know, no more denominations. And then we're, you know, we're a giant denomination. Um, so I share that to say the Kingdom Fellowship Study, which goes to the five concentric circles of Christian fellowship. The point of that study is to explain why they, there are different denominations. And why we're not all just one giant church that everyone does everything together. So instead of discrediting everybody and saying they're all wrong, but we're right, what we're saying is this is why there are so many differences. And there are different levels of Christian fellowship, right? And that goes through. The five levels are very simple. First, it's like the, uh, it's, uh, the children of God. So everybody who's a human being, right, is a child of God. That's what it says. So on a base level, we just need to love people because they were made in God's image, Right? Uh, the second is a faith fellowship, that anybody who believes that Jesus is God and that he died on the cross, anybody who calls themselves a Christian for the most part, that's a faith fellowship. But then there's a lot of nuance in there, and there's a lot of different denominations in there, 400,000 different denominations. And then from the faith fellowship, there is the in Christ fellowship. So there are people who think they're Christians, and then there are people who are actually baptized and saved in the biblical way who are Christians, okay? So, and there's a difference between the general millions and billions of people who claim to be Christians and those who God knows who belongs to him, all right? So there's the everybody in the world, there's everybody who calls themselves Christian, and then there's everybody who's actually in Christ. And then from there, there's the conscience fellowship that we may be in Christ, but there are certain things that we just, we don't see eye to eye on when it comes to how we apply the scriptures in the New Testament. Um, a, big, uh, a big one that we typically talk about is if you go to a traditional church of Christ, they will have no instruments because they don't believe that they sh we, we, there's no instruments in the New Testament, so we shouldn't be using them right now. Now, to be honest, there are some church of Christers that will be like, nah, you go in the hell if you have instruments. But I do think there are some who recognize this is a conscience thing, that in my conscience, I don't feel good with instruments, but I'm not going to condemn you for having instruments in your church. But we won't worship together, all right? We won't take communion. And there's no beef there. That's, you know, y'all do it your way, we do it our way. We'll, we'll have fun in heaven together when we get there, right? Um, and then finally, there's the local fellowship, which is just literally who we are and what we are. And 
and, and who we are as a family together. So those are the five. And to your point, Idris, like, you don't have to, like, there's a lot of information in that study. You don't have to explain all of that in its minutia, right? When you're studying the Bible with somebody, you guys talk through and you figure out what does this person need to know and what don't they need to know, right? Um, yeah, go ahead. Um, I like that study a lot, and I actually find it super duper helpful in studying the Bible with people who have grown up religious and have a lot of background in church and are, you know, we do the, the study about, that talks about baptism right before that, and there are a lot of people at that point who are thinking about, you know, their individual walk with God and whether they need to be baptized or not. And even though they're thinking about their individual life, like anyone who's grown up religious, they're also thinking about so much more than that, kind of this existential crisis of, like, my family and my grandma who died last year and, like, the church I grew up in and what does this mean for, like, you know, there's just so much. <laughs> um, like, heard her growl. There's just so much more that I think sentimental that's going on for a lot of people as they come to that decision that can cloud it for them like if it was just about like okay well what does the bible say and what did i do that's fairly simple but then there's so much emotion and confusion that comes along with like if it's so clear here like why um is there so much confusion in the christian world that study in my mind is really helpful and clears up a lot of that because it goes through some church history like this is why so many different denominations and teachings exist. Like, this is why there are good-hearted people who love the Lord and want the best for you, but have taught you things that aren't necessarily true. And it, like those five circles talk about, like, we have some form of fellowship with all the humans on the planet, regardless, you know, um, whether it's the big circle of we're all created by God or the other Christ, you know, the other people's claiming faith and love for Christ. Like just because we know, just because someone's not in Christ or in our local fellowship, that doesn't mean we can't love them, respect them, work together with them, honor the faith that they have. Like it, in my mind, it's very helpful to help um, people get over kind of the more emotional and sentimental humps that come up for people as they wrestle through their own salvation yeah absolutely and it, it there's a book by F. Lagarde Smith called Who Is My Brother Th this, that study is basically a condensed form of that book it's a fantastic book and he's tackling the question of like who do we fellowship with and, and why do we fellowship with them and, and how do we determine who we fellowship with and why are there different groups it's a fantastic book and so I, I would say, you know, if there's a, I should make a list of books one day that I think all Christians should read, but uh, Who Is My Brother by F. Lagarde Smith. It is a fantastic, fantastic book, um, and, and he might even have some stances, like he's traditional Church of Christ, he might have some stances that are even more hardcore than even what, you know, we'd be, you know, uh, preaching and teaching from uh, over here, um, but still, it, it really helps to give people the categories in their brain to, to, to think through these things. And I think it just alleviates, like, understanding that if you go home and the closest, you know, ICOC church is two hours away, it's like, you can go to church with your grandma. Like, it's fine. Like, you know, we, we used to just, like, go to church. Find some place where people worship in God. It ain't like you place a membership there. It ain't like you commit, like, go find people who love Jesus and worship with um, so it's, it's a study that helps us understand, like, oh, you know, we got something in common. And that means we can have, you know, a lot of partnership and camaraderie and work together with all kinds of people. But again, as far as us and our household are concerned, we're going to do things a certain type of way. And the way this church is going to do it is making the Bible the standard and living to it as, 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 as close as we can. Um, go ahead, Barry. Mr. Runner. I think something that I found was a little bit of a trap for me, though, initially. Um, I think you did a 
wonderful job of writing and talking about core values in this study, but in all the studies. But I, I think it's super important for us to use these five circles of, you know, fellowship stuff as a context for reading the scriptures that are in the study and talking about the scriptures that are in the study. Because I found myself initially like, okay, I'm trying to do the study or whatever, and I'm talking too much instead of, hey, let's read the scripture and let's talk about what the scripture means. Yes. And ideally, I love the fact that they're on your phone, but ideally, I don't want to be sitting there reading off my telephone Correct. while I'm studying the Bible with somebody. Ideally, I think we all ought to be in a place where there's some scriptures that I want to talk about with you yes. that have an idea. And I know what that idea is, and yes. I understand the core value that I can explain to you. But what we're really going to be doing is I'm going to sit down and, and we're going to go to some scriptures and do the, um, I, I'm having Alzheimer's moment. The brother that came and talked to us about how to study the Bible. What was it? Joey. Joey Harris. It, the, ideally, we're, we're not forgetting the stuff that Joey talked about. Of, Absolutely. Hey, look, we read scripture and then we ask them, what does this say to you? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And, and really studying the Bible and not just going, because these are fantastic things, but that's a lot of material. So, uh, well, okay, this is great. That, that study, each um, circle has a scripture by it. And the point of the scripture by it is to express, like, what do we do with this circle of fellowship? So, for instance, the faith fellowship, where we all have different doctrines and, and different understandings of how to be saved, but we all believe in Jesus. The scripture we read, I believe, is Mark, but it's, it's the scripture where the people are casting out demons in the name of Jesus, and the disciples are like, hey, stop that. And Jesus is like, bro, what? Like, they, not, they might not be, like, over here with us specifically, but they're proclaiming my name. Like, don't stop them from doing that. And so what do we do with other denominations that don't see eye to eye with us? Let them be. Love them. Respect them. And the Lord will deal with their uh, mishaps and, and faults. And guess what? He's going to deal with ours as well. So we just got to be humble in that. But all that to say, and we'll end on this. We opened up with Isaiah 55. The, the power is in the word. So the point of these Bible studies is not that you learn how to read them off your phone, but it's that we all grow in the convictions and in the points of these core values, that these are just in our hearts and in our minds. You guys should get to the point where you don't even need to open your phone or open a packet or open a book. But no, you, you, you know to teach somebody. You go to John 12 and you tell them the Bible is the standard, right? Because it will be the word that judges us on judgment day, right? Um, let the word be the thing that's powerful. And you guys go out and make best friends and, and, and study the Bible together. Um, so, amen. Um, I lied again. We went as, normal, uh, as long as we normally do. But guys, this is, this is really good, and we're going to get into the nitty-gritty and the practicals of each study starting um, the last Wednesday of this month. But remember, Vision and Mission uh, Night on May 22nd. Please be here for that. Let me close this out in a word of prayer. We'll be dismissed. God, you are awesome. Thank you so much for your word. And so much that we get to read it freely and have it change our lives and have it change the lives of others, God. And my prayer for us tonight is that you can just light that excitement in all of us for your word. So that it's not something that we have to do or feel like we need to do, but that we love it so much. That it's just something we want to do. Your son, Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen. You are dismissed, guys. Thank you so much for tonight.